Hi everyone, welcome to another John Brooks Pump and Hydraulic Webinar. My name is Stefan Fedeff, I'm a technical sales rep with the John Brooks Company. And joining me again today is going to be Chris Chapman, also a technical sales rep with the John Brooks Company. How are you doing Chris, you can hear me? I am, I'm, I can hear you loud and clear, I'm good. Great. This webinar will be about 40 minutes long, which should leave enough time at the end for questions and answers, hopefully good answers. Um, but your microphone has been muted, so uh, please just use the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen, and uh, then we'll have time to uh, hopefully at the end answer your questions. So we're gonna get started here. Okay, just wanna say a, a, a little word here. We've had over 1,000 registrants uh, since we started the, uh, these uh, five or six webinars, so we really appreciate that, and thanks for the support. We really enjoy um, bringing uh, uh, our knowledge um, and getting your feedback. Uh, it's, it's really great. So who is John Brooks? We were established in 1938. We're a privately held Canadian company and proud of it. And we have over 200 employees across Canada. So we're a full service national supplier of pumps, filtration, spray nozzles, custom skid packages, specialized valves and pressure vessels. So if you have any fluid handling needs, please give us a shout and uh, we'll try and help you out. Thank you. So with that, we'll get started. The setup. So here's a picture of me several years ago with a glass face pump. Unfortunately today, I don't have the glass face pump. I enjoy working with it. It is a great tool. Instead, normally we'd have a picture of Chris here. We don't have one today, but Chris is, uh, has the glass face pump and he is located in the middle of nowhere, Southern Ontario. And he has the glass face pump in his office and it's all raring to go. And here's a picture of it right now. And here's the setup. What we have is a pump. It's a self-priming Gorman Rupp pump. Reason why we choose self-priming, first of all, we like self-priming, but we can see what's going on in the pump. If we used a submersible pump, we would not be able to see what was going on. So it makes a lot of sense. Uh, on the pump side, on the suction side, there's obviously a suction pipe. There is a water barrel, a discharge pipe, and a flow meter. If we come in a little closer, we can see a suction throttle valve. So Chris is going to play around with that to induce uh, different things uh, to happen inside the pump. And on the discharge, we have a discharge throttle valve. And then finally, the setup finishes off with a air bleed valve. This is not a good idea to have in a real pump, but we're gonna use this as an illustration. And then finally on the discharge, we have an air release line. So this is what we have, this is the setup. On the right side, we have the actual pump. This is a, a, a real pump, a real model. It's an 11 and a half Gormer Up pump made in Canada. Um, it's a one and a half inch suction and discharge, self-priming. And if you notice, the suction on the blue pump on the right, the actual pump, is, uh, is quite a bit higher because it's a self-priming pump. We want to make sure that we retain the liquid in the pump between cycles. So therefore, the suction is usually higher so it doesn't drain out of the pump. Well, if we did had that, we wouldn't be able to see the impeller. So what we did was we cut the pump in half down the, down the side, and then we dropped the suction line down. So the suction enters the impeller directly. Now, because of this, if this pump ever stopped and we did happen to lose the suction leg or the liquid drained out of the pump, which doesn't always happen, but it could, uh, we wouldn't have been able to prime again. So that's the reason why we put the hump in the suction line right here. So normally this is a very bad idea as far as um, pump, um, pump um, installation goes. We normally don't want any uh, humps or any area where air can get caught. So this is a bad idea from an installation process, but it's a good idea from uh, the functionality of this the pump to illustrate how it's going to work. So just a quick recap, how do centrifugal pumps move fluid? Well, we have an impeller that spins. Uh, it looks like it's spinning the wrong way there, but it should really spin counterclockwise in this case. And if we surround it by fluid, what's going to happen is we're going to throw that fluid outward using centrifugal effect. 
and what's left behind in the impeller center is a low pressure or a partial vacuum or void. And that's a good thing because no matter what pump we have, positive displacement or centrifugal, we always have to generate a little lower pressure than the outside world, whether that is a tank pressure or a system pressure, because we need to push the fluid into the pump. And that's what we're gonna show here um, even more because uh, it's on a lift. We can really see, see this effect take place. So here's just a little uh, visual of this liquid being thrown out. It's just the particles, in this case, a little computer graphic of uh, a spinning impeller throwing liquid outward. Okay, the whole important part of this webinar is when you guys go to troubleshoot a pump, unfortunately, I can guarantee that it won't be a glass phase pump. So you won't be able to see what's going on inside of the pump. But what you hopefully will have, or if you didn't, you could always install them, would be suction and discharge gauges. So what we wanna to do today is correlate between what you're seeing on the suction and discharge gauges, because that's what you're gonna see in the field, to what's actually happening inside of the pump itself. Again, so when you're in the field, you'll be able to maybe imagine a little bit more what is going on inside of that pump, and therefore it'll help you troubleshoot the, uh, the, the problem or hopefully there are no problems, but you know the way life is sometimes. So Chris will show you this as he's, as he's working the pump. On the left-hand side will be our suction gauge. And in this particular gauge, the zero suction value is at the very top. Now zero suction value means atmospheric pressure. Zero gauge pressure is atmospheric pressure. 14.7 PSI or 101.3 kilopascals. And as we move to the left of that zero, we're getting more and more vacuum until we get down to the very bottom uh, where it shows that 34 feet, and that's gonna be a perfect vacuum, minus 14.7 PSI, 30, 33.96 uh, uh, feet, or minus 101.3 kilopascals. On the discharge gauge, we're only gonna be showing discharge pressure, and here is gonna be the zero value, which is atmospheric pressure. And as we go along, we're gonna see an increase in pressure. So there are the two gauges that we're gonna see and we're gonna use a couple of times. Essentially, the, the scales may be a little bit different than what you may be using in the field, but a suction is always gonna read some kind of uh, value. It may not be a vacuum, but in our case, it will be. And the discharge is always gonna read a discharge value. Okay, self-priming. Let's just go over the self-priming before we hand it over to Chris. So here is the pump itself. Um, let me start this video in a second here. This pump we currently have filled with water because again, a self-priming pump needs to be filled with liquid initially so it can start the priming process. So let me get this pump going. And this is, whoops. Let me, sorry about that. Here we go. So here's the pump going. So what it's doing is it is throwing liquid outward um, from the impeller and that liquid is being thrown out of that interior discharge nozzle and then the liquid is being recirculated and falling back down and refeeding through the recirculation port which is a little hole that refeeds that liquid into the impeller again. So what we're doing is we, we are reusing this liquid over and over again to generate this vacuum in the eye of the impeller. That's a good thing, because if we go over to the left-hand side, we see the pump itself, and we see the suction line going down into the barrel, and there's some fluid there. Now, acting all around us is atmospheric pressure, and the yellow arrow there is showing the atmospheric pressure that's actually pushing down on the surface of the fluid in that tank. And what we've set up now is a differential. The, in the middle of the impeller, there is a low pressure being developed. Outside, there's a higher pressure on sitting on top of that fluid. And therefore, what we have is fluid being pushed up the pipe. It's not being sucked because pumps can't suck. We cannot pull on fluid. What's happening is the impeller is generating a low pressure zone and atmospheric pressure in this case is pushing and trying to get to that low pressure zone. There just happens to be fluid in the way and therefore we're gonna pump. But before that fluid ever gets to the pump itself, there's gonna be this slug of air that has to be fed into or pushed into the impeller. And that's part of the priming process. 
what we're going to get in front of the impeller right here is um, air is going to come in and mix inside of that impeller and the air water mixture is going to get thrown out that scroll of that volute the air is going to slow down the water is going to slow down and the air is going to start rising up out of an air release valve maybe and the liquid is going to come around and recirculate and chris is going to go through that actually so chris over to you okay let's um let's head over to the uh to the to the field here and uh and get a visual of what's happening, uh, uh, of actually what's happening as opposed to graphically. So <clears throat> again, just to kind of uh, recap what, uh, what Stefan has just mentioned is here we have our two gauges. Um, you'll notice that I guess at this point, whether you can actually see these numbers or not, uh, what we're gonna be talking about is really the direction that these arrows are gonna be traveling. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that as, as we go. So here would be the discharge gauge and then your suction gauge. And then heading over to the pump, uh, what we will see here is obviously here's your impeller. And here is the, it was basically the inside of a uh, self-priming pump, which is essentially a standard centrifugal pump. It really is nothing, uh, nothing different. What makes this pump different is this casing uh, that is around that centrifugal, which then makes it or turns it into a self-priming pump. And we'll see We'll see exactly what's happening with this water mixture, air water mixture uh, in this area of this self primer as we go. So <clears throat> you're gonna see a little bit of trick of the eye here. When we turn the impeller on or when we turn the pump on and start pumping, it may look as though the impeller is turning in fact the wrong direction, but it is always going to be counterclockwise uh, rotating in this direction. But due to a trick of the camera, you're gonna see it perhaps going what would appear to be backwards, uh, or in fact backwards and forwards. Um, it's, it's just a trick of the camera. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna start this pump up. And as we, as we, start, as we start this pump up, and we uh, start to throw our fluid outwards from the eye of the impeller, uh, what is, as Stefan said, what is happening is that air and water mixture is getting thrown outwards. And as it is getting thrown outwards, it is basically jettisoned through this discharge nozzle at a fairly high velocity. And as it, en as it exits this nozzle into this large uh, void, it in fact slows down or decelerates really, really quickly. And as it decelerates really quickly, that air that is essentially in our suction line, we can see here that the liquid level is around there, the rest of this is air. So from this point down to our liquid level is an empty suction line. It is in fact full of air. So as that air gets pushed into the pump from atmospheric pressure pushing on that fluid, the air is gonna bubble out through the discharge or perhaps an air release valve. To give you an idea of what's happening from this level downwards to the liquid surface is about two feet. So we have to, we have to lift in quotations, but really the atmospheric pressure is pushing that liquid uh, two feet, approximately two feet up that suction line. So this poor little self primer has to evacuate two feet of air from this suction line. So as we speed this up and get this process moving a little bit quicker, what you're gonna see is that air and water mixture is really getting quite messy, quite turbulent. But essentially what we're seeing is that air and water mixture is coming out and air is continually being bubbled out through the top of the pump. And we're getting a clean, clean-ish fluid heading back to that through that recirculation port to the eye of the impeller, which is then essentially keeping our vacuum draw going. And eventually all of that air is pushed up the suction line, pushed into the pump. And then, as I said, the air is then jettisoned out through the discharge pipe. And now we end up with a pump that is basically fully dynamic. So maybe you guys at that point were focused on what was happening um, at the impeller side. But now I'm going to drop the suction line I'm just opening an air bleed to bring air into that suction side. And we're gonna drop the suction leg again. And then what I want you to take a look at, what I want you guys to watch, is what happens to this suction gauge. So as, as, we, are, as we lift up fluid, or as fluid is pushed into that suction line, our suction gauge is gonna to start to increase. And that is basically telling us that how much column of liquid is in that suction line. And as we eventually bring that fluid up and into this suction pipe, my suction gauge is gonna read that two feet. 
And then once I read my two feet, we're going to get some gauge bounce as clean liquid gets in that pump and surges and more clean liquid. And all of that air is eventually evacuated. And then our suction gauge is going to jump. And our suction gauge jumped due to the fact that we now have friction as well as static, uh, a static component within that suction line. Also, what we can understand with a self primer is the ability for it to handle a little bit of air. If I open the air bleed enough, well, I really don't drop the suction line. But you can also see that what's happening is I'm having an effect on my suction gauge. We're negating that vacuum um, with the air bleed or the air that's entering that pump. But what this means is in a self priming situation that we're able to handle a little bit of entrained air. Um, a little bit of vortexing perhaps at the off level of a sump um, or again if you have some some entrained air potentially in that fluid not necessarily an ideal situation but a self primer will handle uh, some some air so I think at that point we head back over to you Steph great thanks Chris <clears throat> so as you could see uh Chris's discharge gauge really wasn't moving a whole lot there because he had the pump running at a relatively low speed and he wasn't putting a lot of uh, discharge throttle on the pump. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on if, if anyone has any questions. So I'll take control here, Chris. Yep. Okay. All right, this is working relatively well, smoothly. So let's take a look at this actual pump curve for this actual model, the 11 and, Gorman Rupp 11 and a half A, self-priming pump uh, made in Canada. Uh, what we have at the bottom with most centrifugal pump curves, doesn't matter whose it is, we have a flow on the bottom axis. Left side of that is zero. The right side is going to be some higher flow. And on the vertical, we have a head or pressure, uh, sometimes known as total dynamic head or TDH. And total dynamic head can be the value of the of what the pump is generating how much pressure or head the pump is generating can be calculated by taking the discharge gauge and subtracting the suction if there's only one thing you take away from this webinar i think that is crucial total dynamic head what the pump is uh, is actually generating as far as a head or a pressure goes is discharge gauge reading minus the suction so here it is Discharge gauge in our case is on the right side and the suction gauge is on the left side. It makes that equation look a little bit strange, but discharge minus suction. So the next thing that we have in, the, uh, in, in this uh, curve are the speed curves itself. So the top speed curve in this particular pump is 2350, 2350 RPM. And this is on a 4.88 uh, inch diameter impeller. And it goes all the way down to 960 RPM. And I believe Chris will be probably operating somewhere in that 1750 RPM range. So we've got flow, we've got head, and we've got an RPM. Many times there's a few other pieces of information. There's a brake horsepower requirements, there's efficiencies in here, and there's sometimes even MPSH. Uh, but in this curve, we've kind of cleaned it up just for uh, illustrative purposes. So I'll hand it back to you, Chris. Yeah, sure. So let's, um, let's uh, head back to the remote studio and what we're going to do is we're going to get this pump spinning again and i'm going to actually as steph said we're going to get it running at approximately 70 1750 rpm so we'll get the thing going the suction line is full we didn't drain it from our from our priming process so we'll speed her up we'll get her running at about 70 or 76 percent on my vfd is around 1750 rpm and again this is just a trick of the eye just to just to reiterate that the impeller is still in fact pump, uh, moving counterclockwise it's just the way the camera the camera uh, picks the speed up and says it's going in the opposite direction but what we're going to do is we're going to generate some back pressure i'm going to generate some back pressure by closing a valve and really all i'm doing here is simulating some form of piping system so we've installed the pump, the, the pump's been started up, and we want to figure out basically how much flow this pump is generating. So we start the pump up and it is pumping, and we know the speed because we've, we've tacked it at 1750. And from a discharge gauge reading, we are reading plus 12 feet on the discharge side. You writing right. this down? Got it down, yeah, Steph? I am. 
Yeah. And then on the suction side, we are reading uh, about five feet, minus five feet um, of vacuum. Okay. So that is essentially our duty point as if, as if we had this pump in an actual application. So we'll head back over to Steph with the pump curve. Okay. If all our startups could be this uh, slick, Chris, eh? I know, technology when it works. Okay, so what did Chris say? He said the pump was operating at about 1750 RPM, so it's right here. So there's only three reasons why this pump should, or I think any, anyway, let me know if there's any more than three reasons why this pump wouldn't operate here, is if the pump is old and worn, this is a new pump's operating curve right here, 1750 RPM. That would be reason number one. Reason number two would be if there's air entrainment. When we entrain air into a centrifugal pump, it doesn't operate where you think it's gonna operate on its curve. And the third reason is if there's suction cavitation, okay? There are three reasons why this pump wouldn't operate on its curve. So let's see where, it, where this pump is operating. So we know it's 1750 RPM now. What values did, he, did Chris tell us? He said, on the discharge side, we had 12 feet. Now remember, we're measuring in feet. Remember, 2.31 feet is equal to one PSI, or 2.31 feet of water column is equal to one PSI. So 12 feet of water column is what? About four or five PSI. But let's keep it in feet. The discharge gauge reading said 12 feet, and our suction gauge reading said minus five feet. So 12 subtract minus five is kind of like adding the two together because we're subtracting a ne negative. So we're getting 17 feet. So if I come along here, here's my 15, here's my 17, and we're in feet right here. So 17 is gonna be somewhere in this range. If I come along, along the horizontal until I hit the pump curve, and then come down, I should be pumping about 30 US gallons a minute. And if I can trust this pump to say, hey, this pump, I know it's new, I know it should be operating on that curve, then I can pretty well take that to the bank with those gauge readings. Those gauge readings should be giving me a value and therefore I can take that value and, and, and get a flow, a flow from it. Um, it's really powerful, you don't need a flow meter. And I'll pass it over to you, Chris. Yeah, so now what we're going to do then is we'll head back to the pump and what we're going to do is we're going to get her running again. <clears throat> now I haven't changed the valve. I haven't changed the valve in any way. So as soon as we start this pump up again and get her pumping at the same 1750 RPM, we are essentially reading the same gauge readings we had before, so plus 12 minus 5 and we have a flow meter. I think Steph may have pointed that out at the, um, at the beginning of this. So we're actually able to double check our numbers. And in fact, my flow meter in my office here says we're doing about 28 gallons a minute. And I think we were somewhere in that 25 to 30, right, Steph? That's correct, 30. Yep, so we're pretty yep. close. So we're pretty close. So now what I'm going to do, though, is, well, and Steph will talk about this from a, from a curve perspective. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to close the discharge valve down completely. And Wait, we're going, don't do it, Chris, don't do it. Don't do it, don't do it. So we're gonna close this valve down and I could end up with a very wet office. So if this all goes wrong, then you guys, you know, you guys will hear about it on the news. So we're gonna close the valve down and you'll notice that my discharge gauge is increasing. The needle is moving into the positive, but my suction gauge has actually dropped off or dropping off. So now I am actually at full, Full valve closed. My discharge valve is completely closed. My flow meter is reading zero flow. And our gauge readings, if you want to write these down, Steph. Yeah. My gauge readings are 21 feet on the discharge, and we are minus two on the suction. Wonderful. So why minus two on the suction? We're moving no flow. So if we go back to what I said earlier, is that from this point down, we have an approximate value of a two foot static suction lift. Well, in fact, at zero flow, which we're at right now with a closed discharge valve, this pump still has to hold up that column of fluid. So something else that you can get out of this shutoff test that Steph is gonna explain just, just shortly, is that by doing a shutoff test, we can actually determine what our static suction lift might, have, you know, might be. 
if, if it was a piece of information we didn't know. So I'm going to open this valve up again slowly because we don't want to do this too, too long. And you can see our gauges will go back to normal. I'm going to open them all the way in this case. So let's head back to the pump curve and take a look at what shutoff is actually uh, going to provide us from a pump curve and a, uh, a pump integrity perspective. Okay, thanks, Chris. And I just want to say a word of warning. What Chris just did was called a pump shutoff test or a deadhead test. And please read the manual. Not all pumps you should do this to. And definitely, um, even the pumps you can do it to, they usually don't like it. And we'll talk about that why and we'll see it actually. But again, read the manual because what Chris just did could be very, very dangerous. Obviously on a positive displacement pump, very dangerous. And some uh, centrifugal pumps, you will destroy that pump. So just be very careful about that. Uh, read the manual. So Chris just performed a shutoff test. Who cares? Su uh, discharge minus suction always holds. So let's do discharge minus suction. He said, if I, my notes were correct, he got 21 feet on the discharge, which is what, about seven or eight PSI. And on the suction, he got minus two He was feet. He was just showing the actual lift. So if I take 21, subtract minus two, I get 23 feet. And let's see where we are. So we were at zero flow. So our flow is at zero. That's because we did a shutoff test. We don't need a flow meter to do this test. And 20, where 1750 crosses the zero flow line is to me looks about 23 feet. So 99% of the time, if my shutoff value corresponds to where the uh, pump curve is, then 99% of the time, I would say you can trust the rest of that curve. Okay, so it's a nice way to go to say, oh, now I can start taking gauge readings and trusting what value for flow they're going to give me. It's a really nice test to be able to perform if you can. And let me just go through that calculation right there. Um, I think that was it, Chris. So, okay, so now we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to move on. I'm going to talk about cavitation. And first of all, we're going to talk about suction cavitation. So I think you guys might've seen this before, but I'll play it again. It is very illustrative of, of the whole crux of cavitation. Here I've got water. It's just, just plain water at room temperature. Well, it's at 23 degrees actually, according to the thermostat uh, thermometer. And what we're going to do is we're going to roll the video and watch the temperature pretty well stays the same. But what we're getting is boiling. This liquid, this water is boiling at 23 degrees Celsius. Now, if I was in a room, I'd say, hey, why is that happening? But you probably both, most of you probably know. Um, what we're doing is we've got this inside of a case and we've got a vacuum pump and we're removing atmospheric pressure from um, affecting this liquid. So there's nothing sitting on this liquid. There's no external pressure sitting on this liquid to keep this liquid liquid. It's like me taking water, a cup of water out into outer space. Just as long as it did not freeze, as soon as I got it out into outer space where there's no pressure, it would vaporize. That's the key to cavitation here. We're vaporizing fluid. So if you'd call us and you say, I've got a really noisy pump, and it's not because of a bearing, it's not because of misalignment, it's not because of a rub, then Chris and I, we won't jump to too many conclusions, but we're thinking already cavitation, because it's the number one cause of hydraulic noise. So what is cavitation? Cavitation is the vaporization or the boiling of a liquid, and then the implosive return of the vapor back to liquid. It is not caused by air bubbles. Air bubbles cause other problems, but it does not cause cavitation. And Chris will show that in a second. So here's a vapor bubble on the left-hand side, and it's obviously vapor. And it's traveling in uh, to the right side, and it's going into a high pressure zone, okay? There's a lot of different kinds of zones inside of a, 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 a pump, as you can imagine. On the left-hand side, this vapor bubble's in low pressure, and on the right-hand side, it's going into high pressure. And as it goes into high pressure, it starts to collapse and turn back into liquid. But it doesn't do this nicely. What it's doing is it's collapsing back in, but it's sending out this pressure spike at the bottom. And that pressure spike, when this actual vapor bubble collapses back into liquid, that pressure spike can reach to about two to 300,000 PSI. Now, I don't know of a material that can handle a pressure spike, a localized pressure, pressure spike, 
of two to 300,000 PSI. And there's the rub, there's the problem. And here's an actual picture, an actual video of this vapor bubble that's collapsing and turning back into liquid. And here it goes. So it's, this is microscopic, remember? And here we go, there's that pressure spike. This is turning back into liquid and two to 300,000 PSI right there. Bang, and you'll hear a pop. And this suction cavitation has to do with net positive suction head calculations. We went through this a couple of webinars ago. I'm not gonna go through it again today, but essentially at the end of it all, we're pulling too much vacuum on that liquid and we're, we are vaporizing it. Now again, it doesn't always have to be a lot of vacuum. If we're pumping warm gasoline or a hydrocarbon, maybe we don't have to pull too much vacuum or maybe we have to keep a pressure you know, above, above atmospheric pressure to stop this stuff from, from flashing. So don't always think that we have to be really down in the negatives to vaporize this fluid. Your fluid could change. Hey, if I've got water at 99 degrees Celsius, I don't have to do too much vacuum to that liquid, to, to, uh, to that water to cause it to, to vaporize. So be careful. You know, things can vaporize under very, very low, uh, low vacuums as well. So again, if you've got NPSH excess, and again, Send me an email if you want me to explain this or send you some information on it. But MPSH excess, as long as it's positive, as long as we've got some positive absolute pressure still remaining, sitting on that liquid, keeping it liquid, we will not vaporize. If we get negative in the calculation, we're in trouble. So what's the problem here? Well, what happens is we might pull, obviously, uh, any kind of pump. It doesn't have to be a self-primer. It could be any type of centrifugal or a positive displacement pump we could be pulling a high vacuum at the, at the suction head, at the suction here, it just happens to be the middle of the impeller. And if we pull enough vacuum or exert enough vacuum on that liquid, it may boil or vaporize at room temperature or whatever the temperature is at, just like that glass, that video that we showed at the very beginning. What's wrong with that? Well, the problem is this, we vaporize the fluid on the left-hand side really not a problem it takes up space so we don't pump as much it's it's, it's displacing the liquid so our, our flow drops off but it's the right side of this uh, image that that's the trouble we're going to get these these uh, vapor bubbles collapsing back into liquid and firing off this two to three hundred thousand psi pressure spike and this is how it occurs the vapor bubble forms at the eye where the lowest pressure is and then it travels gets thrown out by the impeller and pressurized and as it gets pressurized, it collapses and causes that two to 300,000 PSI um, vapor um, uh, pressure spike. And it doesn't happen one at a time. Under severe cavitation, which we'll see in a second, we could have thousands of these, maybe millions of these vapor bubbles uh, collapsing all at once. And this is the problem with cavitation. Absolutely nothing to do with air. It looks like air, absolutely nothing to do with air. And I believe I'm going to pass it over to you, Chris, in a second here. This is just a, uh, a picture of, a, uh, of an impeller. And you can see the impeller veins are missing in the middle. And you can, if you look really closely, it looks like someone's taken a little Dremel and drilled little holes all over this thing. And that is due to these two to 300,000 uh, PSI pressure spikes hitting the surface of this impeller. And it's very noisy. Today, Chris, I don't think it's gonna get that noisy because uh, Chris is kind of running the pump a little bit slower, but it is noisy. And just again, remember, suction cavitation can occur in any type of pump. Don't just think it's this self-priming thing or don't just think it's a centrifugal thing. Suction cavitation can occur in any type of pump. Over to you, Chris. Okay, so uh, thanks for the theory side of that. Let's uh, now put that in. Uh... In practice, uh, we just head back over to my camera. So let's get this uh, let's get this puppy running. I'm going to run a little bit faster than what we were doing to get our duty point. Uh, and what I'm going to do is to induce or to generate a vacuum, a high vacuum draw going to start to close down that suction valve, just like I did on the discharge side to get us a shut off. I'm actually going to close the suction valve to generate, um, generate a max back. So as I close this valve down, you can kind of spin your eyes between the pump itself and the backing gauge, and you'll see that our backing gauge 
is increasing. We're getting closer and closer to that to that absolute that Steph talked about at 33 feet there, 33.9 feet. We're kind of heading towards 20, 20 feet of vacuum. And we're starting to see some cavitation occurring in the pipe. You may see some spurts of that coming through on that suction pipe. And as I continue to close this down, we're going to see more and more vapor bubbles occurring until we get to the point where we are now actually, I've closed the valve down completely and we are now in full suction cavitation situation. And we can zoom in here. That's nice, Chris. Yep. And basically what we're seeing here is exactly what was described. We're seeing this vapor bubbles occurring right at the eye of the impeller. And as those vapor bubbles travel outwards towards the high pressure area of the impeller vane, they start to implode and turn back into liquid again. Um, I'm hearing some noise. I'm hearing some, like we're pumping marbles, like we're pumping some gravel, but in fact, we all know this is clean, clear water. A suction gauge is reading, in this case, about 27 feet, or in another term, uh, 20, 24 inches of, uh, of vacuum. And this carryover is really just some impurities in that water, but essentially, all of the suction cavitation is occurring at that eye. Just to prove that this isn't air, I'm going to zoom back out again. And I'm actually going to open the air bleed a little bit. And I want you to watch two things. The suction gauge is actually going to drop off because we will actually start to negate the vacuum by using atmospheric pressure to, to negate that vacuum and neutralize that vacuum. But also watch how air entrainment is now everywhere within the pump um, as opposed to suction cavitation, which was right at the eye. So that kind of proves that cavitation or air is not cavitation. So I need to open this suction valve up extremely slowly because we've got some, got a lot of things happening inside this pump, high vacuum draw as well as air bubbles. If I open up this suction valve and get the pump pumping again, we're still in an air entrainment situation. I still have the air bleed open, uh, but you can again see how the self primer was able to kind of burp all that air out of the system and get dynamic again. And then I'll close the air bleed and the pump is now back to running normally. Hey, Chris. The, yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Keep going. Okay. The other thing that we can do is just like we did on the uh, shutoff, just like we did on the, on the shutoff at zero flow, we can actually check the integrity of this pump. So running at 1750 or running at any speed, we would expect a pump to be able to generate you know, so much of a vacuum. And some pump technologies and some pump designs are going to be slightly different. But we can basically close this suction valve down. And again, keep an eye on that suction gauge. And what's going to happen is we're going to get to a point again where we're pulling close to max vacuum. And this pump is pulling 20, 28 feet of vacuum again, 20, 20, uh, two, four, 24 uh, inches of vacuum. So to me, this is a good pump. This pump is pulling some pretty decent, uh, decent vacuum draw. Anything you want to add there, Steph? Okay, yeah. No, I, I was just going to ask, just to help people out, because the, the noise isn't as good as if you were there. From a troubleshooting perspective, if they didn't have gauges, was there a big difference in the noise from when you were fully uh, suction cavitating to where, when you had air entrainment, heavy air, air entrainment? Is there any telltale signs or no? It's very difficult. Yeah, so from, a, from the position we're in right now, the pump is happy, it's dynamic. We're getting a lot of VFD wine, that's about it. If we do a max back, then you're starting to hear that popping and ticking, and uh, like you've got like you've got um, gravel in a tin can. That's kind of the noise that I'm hearing here. If we then open this up and induce some air, really all I'm hearing here is like a just to me sounds like a shower head, really. There's nothing, there's nothing gravelly about it. There's nothing um, overly noisy about it. You're just hearing, uh, like I say, like a bit of a shower head is an example I could use. So a dollar, a dollar noise. A dollar, much dollar, yeah. Okay, okay. Again, we're trying to give you tools because you won't have a glass face pump. And hopefully you have gauges. So, we'll, so that's suction cavitation. So we'll head back. Over to Steph. You must be doing something really wrong because we've uh, we've got a lot of questions here, Chris. Really. <laughs>
we'll pick those up right at the end there. Okay. So next, what we're going to talk about is this discharge cavitation recirculation. So there's three different types of cavitation, but we're going to break it up into two types. The first was obviously suction cavitation. So maybe some of you may not have seen this before. It all comes down to this guy, Bernoulli. And what Bernoulli said was, as the velocity of a fluid increases, its pressure decreases. And conversely, as the velocity of a fluid decreases, its pressure increases. Essentially, there's only so much energy in a, flu uh, on a, in a moving fluid. And when velocity goes up, pressure is the bank account for energy. It has to pay the price. So it has to give some of its energy to, to velocity. When velocity comes down, it can give some of its energy to pressure. So it's just a seesaw balancing act. That's essentially it. That's my understanding anyway. I'm only a civil engineer. Venturi. This is an illustration of the, uh, of the Bernoulli effect. Essentially, all what a Venturi is, is a pipe and it's hollow all the way through and it necks down in the middle. And what we do is we use this to pull a vacuum and we use it for all sorts of things, spray, spray uh, guns and all sorts. So if we can imagine we push a certain fluid through one side of this Venturi, one liter per second, whatever it's gonna be. Out the other side, due to continuity, it can't get stored anywhere. We will still see the same amount of flow going out the other end, one liter per second. Now, in order to get one liter per second through this pipe, and especially through this smaller section and cross-sectional area, that velocity has to go up. We're trying to squeeze this, the same amount of fluid through a smaller cross-sectional area. The, the velocity has to go up. And like I said before, uh, pressure is the bank account of energy. And therefore, the pressure has to drop and it has to transfer some of its energy uh, to velocity. Okay, and pressure drops. And then what we can do is we can use this for a spray guns and all sorts of priming devices, whatever. Um, it's, it, it's a great little device, but it uses Bernoulli's principle. So what does this have to do with pumps? Well, Chris got his pump going, or he will in a second. And as we know, we're pumping a certain amount of flow. Then what Chris is going to do is he's going to throttle this valve a little bit. Now remember, in the field, someone isn't necessarily throttling a valve. Maybe there's a filter that's starting to block up, or maybe someone hasn't unplugged the pipe somewhere, or there's a lot more friction than what you've calculated. So there's a, there's a, it's not always this simple. But essentially, what it's going to do is, we're now not going to pump as much. As we know on, on that uh, curve, that pump curve, as we increased our pressure that our pump had to pump against, our flow became less and less. But unfortunately, this liquid, this impeller is still throwing the same amount of fluid. It's still tr trying to throw the same amount of fluid. So what happens is, since not all that fluid is leaving the case of the pump, but uh, most of it is still leaving the impeller, then some of that flow wants to try and recirculate back into the impeller. Now, this is when we put some throttle on this, on this pump. That doesn't sound too bad until you think about it and say, yes, but that impeller is still throwing fluid outward. And what we get is this interplay, this turbulence of one liquid going one way, another liquid coming the other way, and where they kind of meet and cross paths, we're gonna get some high velocities, or we potentially could get some high velocities. And what did we say with high velocities? Well, we could get a low pressure. When we get high velocities, our pressure drops. And if our pressure drops below that MPSH calculation value, then we are gonna be in trouble. We will vaporize that fluid. And this is the hardest thing to, to imagine, that we can drop the pressure so much on the discharge side of the pump. It doesn't make sense. I think we all could understand dropping the pressure on the suction side, but on the discharge side, but it's all due to Bernoulli. So recirculation cavitation, not very noisy. Uh, you'll find that out. Suction cavitation is still noisier. And, um, and it usually affects the middle portion of the vein. So suction cavitation affected the center of the impeller or the leading edge of that impeller vein. Uh, recirculation cavitation affects the center portion, the midsection, right here, the midsection of the vein. But wait, there's more. Let's talk about the final kind of cavitation, which is discharge cavitation, which Chris will definitely be able to show you. And discharge cavitation is when we take this to the limit, when we do the shutoff test, essentially. We've got this pump pumping, 
and then all of a sudden we do this. Our valve is completely closed. Again, this may not happen in the field. Actually, maybe what happens in the field is that something clogs the line in the discharge line, uh, filter backs up, or there's too much friction losses, whatever it is. This may not be just this simple. But essentially what we get when we take that pump to shut off or, or zero flow while it's still running, we get this recirculation cavitation. That is, without, that is for sure, we're going to get recirculation cavitation just like before. But there's not enough area across the front face to recirculate all that fluid. So the fluid has to find another location to slip back to suction. And what it finds is the little portion, and Chris can show you this a lot better than I can here, the little portion that's between the cut water of the, of the pump casing and the impeller vein tip. So what happens is, this liquid's all trying to recirculate, so it's coming back the through the face, like we talked about before with recirculation, but now it's trying to squeeze its way in between the impeller tip and that cut water. And as that impeller comes around, that area, that cross-sectional area gets smaller and smaller. And guess what? As it gets smaller, the fluid has to speed up because there's less and less space for this fluid to get through. And the velocity goes up and it goes up way too much and it vaporizes the fluid. Not a problem until the next vein comes along and pressurizes, let me go back, sorry. And the next vein comes along and pressurizes that, um, whoa, whoa, I'm, hang on, Chris. Mm -hmm. Lost control here. Houston, we have a problem, no, we don't, we're good. <laughs> Apollo, was it Apollo 13? So that next vein comes along and then that vapor bubble gets pressurized and bang, two to 300,000 PSI because it's turning back into liquid. And what we can see, if you ever send us a, 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 an impeller and say, hey, you know, you sold us a really bad impeller here. You machined it with holes in it. And we'll go, well, maybe we did, but let's hope not. Um, we'll take a look at this and we'll say, now that's discharge cavitation. It's at the tip of that middle, middle drawing right here. That middle picture shows you the tip cavitation. All these little holes in the very tip at the outer portion of the impeller vein. And you can see that's where all those two to 300,000 PSI pressure spikes have occurred. And it'll also occur on the cut water and the casing. Okay, so I think I'm passing it over to you, Chris. Yeah, again, this isn't as loud as, as suction cavitation. And again, just to show you, this was the shutoff test that we just performed. So remember, Discharge cavitation can occur in almost any type of centrifugal pump. Where it doesn't usually occur is if we've trimmed the impeller, then we get recirculation. But essentially it can occur in any type of centrifugal pump. Okay, okay. yeah, so uh, but again, let's um, take a look at that practically. You say that as an, in a negative. Well, you know, I'm a practical kind of guy. Yeah, I'd like the book learning myself. So let's, uh, the, uh, everything is still as was left prior. We have liquid in the suction line, liquid in the pump. So we're going to turn her on and we're going to get it spinning. I am actually going to run this a little bit faster again. So um, the impeller is definitely going to look like she is moving very, very quickly. Just as one more reminder, the impeller is always traveling in this direction, yet Trick of the trick of the uh, the uh, um, camera is the way that it looks like it's jerky a little bit. But we are probably running, I would say, close to 2,000, maybe 2,100 RPM. So just as we did with the shutoff test, I'm going to begin to close the discharge valve, and we'll notice that the discharge gauge will go up, the suction gauge will drop off as we basically reduce our flow. And right now I'm under full shutoff, so zero flow. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom into the cut water. And what I want everyone to take a look at is going to be tough. It's tough in real life. In fact, I can see it better on the camera than I can in real life. But somewhere here, you'll start to see a lightning strike coming from the midway between the cut water. And what's happening is that, that, that as that impeller vein hits probably around this area here, that decrease in that space uh, allows the liquid to recirculate through, increases velocity, and then decreases that pressure. And then as Steph had mentioned, once that in next impeller vein comes around, pressurizes that zone, and then basically implodes, the, the vapor bubble, or vapor area implodes and turns it back into liquid again. So hopefully everyone can see that, is that little lightning strike coming uh, from, from right to left 
Uh, on my computer screen, it would be about a half inch, three quarter inch long. And again, looks just like a lightning strike. Perfect. Yeah, I can see it. We can definitely see it. doesn't look like much. It, uh, and, it's, and really, to be honest, from a noise point of view, um, there was no difference. Really, from, from on this size of unit, uh, it would vary depending on different pumps. But the pump in here, in my office of this small size, at zero flow off or shut off, uh, and the discharge cavitation conditions, I heard no noise change. So it is tough to hear. Um, so the gauges, again, give you, that, give you that indication of what's happening. Sure. And, and obviously, different pump models will, will, and different pump manufacturers, depending on the design, it can get quite noisy also on the discharge cavitation. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So we'll head back over to you. Okay. I'll take control here, Chris. Okay. So we've asked this question many times at Lunch and Learns, Chris and I, and, and whatever. Uh, what's the worst, suction cavitation or discharge cavitation, this discharge recirculation? And we always lead you down the garden path, suction cavitation, when we get this and you hear it, it sounds horrible. You can't even hear us talking over it under some models. But it's actually recirculation discharge cavitation. That is the worst, even though it was just that little bit of a flash that you could see, whereas when Chris took this to suction cavitation, the whole suction side seemed to explode with these vapor bubbles. Well, discharge cavitation is definitely the worst, and here's the reason. Suction cavitation, as we said, everything happens at the eye or at the center of the impeller. And uh, with discharge and recirculation, everything's happening on the outer portion of the impeller. So let's take a look at where, what's going on. If we take a look at the side view, here's the impeller itself spinning from the side. You can see the mechanical seal, the shaft, the bearings, and the, and the bearing housing. Essentially, all these two to 300,000 hammer blows, these PSI hammer blows, are acting down the shaft. This is not great. Hey, you might get some chatter on your mechanical seals, you might get some bearing issues, but it's acting down the shaft. Unfortunately, with discharge um, cavitation, all the hammer blows are happening perpendicular to the shaft. And every time, this is a two vein impeller, uh, Chris's is also a two vein impeller, but every time one of those veins passes the cut water, there is a hammer blow, boom. And what do you think is happening to that poor little shaft? It's constantly being, again in a moment, it's constantly being fatigued. And eventually you will destroy an impeller, make mechanical seals leak, and then finally break this, the impeller right off the shaft. And in my office, I've got one, but I won't show it to you right now, where you actually see the impeller shaft still threaded into the, um, the impeller itself. Again, if this was a submersible pump and we took it to discharge cavitation, unfortunately, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get that vibration and those mechanical seals are probably gonna start to chatter and we're gonna start to get some ingress of fluid possibly into that seal area and then possibly into the motor housing. So, hey, any kind of centrifugal pump this can happen to. If anyone ever says a submersible pump can't cavitate, well, yes, they can, for sure. So, broken shafts. It all comes down, I always like to say this, because as I said, Chris, I'm a book learner in some ways. Mm -hmm. Where the pump's going to operate is where the system curve's going to tell the pump to operate. Really crucial. So, again, all this always comes back to, have we got the right design pump, and did we do the calculations correctly? So, just before you go, I just want to say, uh, our next webinar I'm very excited about, Pumping Downhill, Unpredictable Monster. And I'm really excited about this. Uh, this is when we can throw everything we've learned over the last uh, few weeks out the window. And this is when we've got an undulating system on the discharge of the pump. And we start to try and figure out where our static is and where our friction is. And we start to get into some real tough issues. And what we'll do next uh, webinar in two weeks is we'll go through this with some real funky uh, computational uh, fluid dynamics. And uh, I I'm really looking forward to, 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 to this presentation. That's your new toy, isn't it, Steph? That is my new toy. It your is. Toy. Yeah, come, it is because I'm a book learner again. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, Chris, do we have time? We've got some Yeah, let's, uh, let's take a quick look and see what uh, we've got five minutes. Let me see if there's anything there. And obviously those that did ask, if we don't get to them, then you know, we'll respond to you guys. Um, 
personally. Um, does air in a pump cause pitting? Um, it certainly isn't going to sh cause the same amount or the same look of damage. I wouldn't have thought. Do you think this, Steph? I, I, I'm, that's a tough question for me. You know, it, it is going to cause some some um, turbulence. Um, you know, air itself. It, you know, it, it is it is always going to be like that. Air and water together. If it's a salty liquid, you know, you're going to get some some corrosion maybe built up. You're not going to see, I don't think, that kind of pitting, though. It's not going to be mm. so like someone's taking a little Dremel. It may be just like a wear. Uh, but essentially, if you see that very, very precise hole drills, um, then I would say you're not looking at air. And suction gauges and discharge gauges should tell you whether you've got air in the system because you'll see bounce. Uh, would a viscous fluid also affect the pump performance curve? That could be another, that could be a topic for you for later on, Stefan, is uh, viscous viscosity corrections on centrifugal pump curves. Big time. Yeah, oh yeah, it's, it, it's definitely out there. Hydraulic Institute, there are corrections for a pump's performance. We always say tested on water, most centrifugal pumps are, but there's a way to, to, um, to recalculate those performances, the horsepowers um, and the heads uh, when we've got viscous liquid. So yeah, that's a different topic. Uh, safety margin for MPSH? <clears throat> good, good question. It all depends. Hydraulic Institute have their guidelines. Uh, it really does depend on what type of fluid you're pumping. If you're pumping a hydrocarbon, uh, Hydraulic Institute wants you to have a little higher margin and also types of the type of impeller you have, whether it's a low energy or a high energy. That's all part of the Hydraulic Institute. For me, always get the manufacturer or the manufacturer's representative to give you some recommendations because they know their product pretty well and they've applied it many times. This is a good one. I have some old uh, photos of an old impeller. If I understood correctly, you can visually see cavitation on the inside of the impeller vanes while the discharge cavitation can be seen on the outside of the vanes. Well, <clears throat> it's a bit more centralized than that. Um, suction cavitation is always going to be localized to the eye uh, and maybe just on the, um, like on the inside of the uh, impeller vane, but really focused at the eye location. Recirculation cavitation is going to be halfway between or, or midway. It doesn't even have to be halfway, but somewhere along the, the edge between the suction and the discharge or the tip. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Steph, but recirculation cavitation can actually be on the inside or the outside of that location, depends on the impeller design. Well, if you, were, if you think about a fence, um, that, that void in between the two impellers, it, it, it's on the inside of one side of the impeller and it's on the outside of the other impeller. So if that swirl is taking place, it's going to affect that whole region, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. usually it is the, that leading edge because that's where the pressure is gonna take place as that impeller comes around. So it's gonna be usually on that outside. Leading, okay. Yeah. And, then t and then discharge cavitation will be always on the tips and on the cut water. So there's the three, the three types of cavitation with their three somewhat localized um, areas. If you, have the, if you have the impeller picture and you wanna send it to us, more than happy to look at it. Yeah, I'll just click here, Chris, my email. Okay, so in, uh, I think in respect of time, uh, there's some questions here that we can certainly respond to. We've, um, and uh, thank you for attending. Yeah, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. And uh, see you in a couple of weeks and stay safe and enjoy the nice weather. Thank thanks you. Thanks again. See ya.